Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome uh, to the Greens List breakfast briefings. Um, my name's Tom Hurley. I'm on Greens List, have been for a while, and I have been invited to chair this morning's um, proceedings. Breakfast briefing on appeals from the from VCAT and the AAT. There are two presenters today. First one is Tiffany Ackerman. Um, Tiffany uh, comes to us from uh, having graduated in the University of Tasmania and having done some time uh, in Canberra with the Department of Environment's Policy and Law Unit. She was catapulted into the centre of the cosmos by becoming Associate to Chief Justice Marilyn Warren, where she was for two years. She's now on Greens List, uh, practising extensively in administrative law and particularly in uh, planning, as well as general commercial litigation. Thanks, Tom, and good morning, everyone. Um, I might say it's early, <laughs> and it's a couple of hours earlier than I'm used to being on my feet speaking about the law, but I'll press on, and hopefully none of us will fall asleep. Um, had the advantage of having a little bit of breakfast before we started, so that's good. Okay, I'll be speaking about the AAT and VCAT generally to start with, and then I'll be describing the statutory appeal provisions, um, which provide a means to bring appeals from the decisions of those tribunals to the courts. I'll then be following with some procedural matters. Uh, then we'll have a break, and Sam will be coming back to speak about the nature of the appeals that can be brought under the Acts. So at the outset, we need to acknowledge that there are other methods of bringing appeals from VCAT and AAT decisions. We won't be looking at them today in any detail. The majority of the decisions come from section, uh, sorry, the majority of the appeals are brought under section 44 of the AAT Act and section 148 of the VCAT Act. Now, you could also use the prerogative writs, mandamus, certiorari and prohibition, and there's also statutory judicial review available under the Administrative Law Act in Victoria and the ADJR Act in, at the federal level. <clears throat> you just have to excuse me, I will admit I'm a little bit ill at the moment, so my voice is crumbling slightly. Um, So you should all have a copy of the paper that Sam and I put together. That goes into quite a lot more detail than I'll be um, going into today. Sam and I will be presenting some highlights from that paper. Uh, and we won't actually be following the order. So that's really something that you can take back to the office, have a bit of a read at your leisure, shove it in your bottom drawer, never look at it again until this situation comes up and you think, ding, I've got that paper. So um, by all means, just put it aside for a rainy day. Now, um, if we have a look at the tribunals themselves, I'll just do a quick refresher. You remember that the AAT operates at the federal level, does merits review of federal government decision makers, um, ministers, offices of departments, other tribunals. For example, uh, a decisions of Centrelink officers can be reviewed by the Social Security Appeals Tribunal, and then that tribunal's decision can be appealed to the AAT, and they'll conduct a merits review of it. So they will stand in the shoes of the original decision maker with the powers of that decision maker and look at the facts and come to a new decision of their own. Um, there is on the AAT website a 227 page document which gives the list of the acts that refer powers to the AAT. It's quite a useful resource, um, it is long and there are a lot of acts that refer to the AAT so if you're ever in doubt just have a look at that, it's on the website. VCAT in contrast um, operates at the state level but also operates to, um, to hear a broader range of disputes than the AAT. So it's administrative review of local and state government decisions, such as planning decisions, but also um, it hears private disputes between private entities, such as 
consumer and trader disputes under the Fair Trading Act. So it doesn't just uh, conduct administrative review. There are also um, hearings between private parties. We'll mostly be looking at the administrative review side today. Um, by way of an aside, the Administrative Review Council is currently conducting investigating, investigating options for the future of judicial review at the federal level, and in particular they're going to be looking at the constitutional means of judicial review and the statutory means of judicial review. So that would be the um, prerogative writs compared with statutory reviews such as the ADJR Act and also the AAT Act. Now, different jurisprudence has developed um, between these areas and they're looking at the differences there. One of the issues they're looking at is Section 44 of the AAT Act, whether it should be changed, whether it should be retained even. Um, submissions have closed in June, so uh, they're all up on the website for the Administrative Review Council um, and they're due to report to the Attorney General by the end of the year so just bear in mind that some changes may be coming whether they are uh, wholesale changes is another matter. So to turn back to some administrative law basics I explained merits review is standing in the shoes of the original decision maker and that courts undertake judicial review. This is a different power. Courts and tribunals exercise different power. In judicial review, courts don't remake the original decision. What they ask is whether the original decision was made according to law. So they look at the legality and, and questions of law. They don't ask what are the facts and make findings of facts on those. So the provisions in the Act, Section 44 and Section 148, actually reflect this difference because they allow appeals on questions of law, not on questions of fact. So our first real point today is that if you're appealing from the AAT and VCAT to the courts, you can only really do so on a question of law, and that is fundamental to everything we're going to speak about today. You have a handout sheet, I believe, with the acts on them, with the provisions. They're quite detailed. Read them later, please. <laughs> In short, both provide a means of appeal by a party to a proceeding on a question of law. In the case of the AAT, that appeal will go to the Federal Court, and in the case of VCAT, the appeal will go to the Supreme Court of Victoria. There's a notable difference in the wording in that in the AAT provision, the wording says that the appeal is from any decision of the tribunal whereas the VCAT appeal is from any order of the tribunal if leave is given. Now, that makes for a couple of practical differences. Section 44, the words any decision of the AAT have been interpreted quite narrowly. Uh, although it says any decision, the case law says that that is any final decision. So decisions at an interlocutory stage can't be appealed through Section 44, although they can likely be appealed through the ADJR Act or the prerogative writs. The second, sorry, the VCAT Act, Section 3, the definition of order includes interim order, so it's quite clear that at VCAT, interlocutory decisions can be appealed to the Supreme Court. The second difference is the leave provision in section 148. Um, it effectively creates an extra hurdle to jump. So when you're appealing a decision by VCAT, you need to apply to the Supreme Court for leave, and if leave is granted, then you can bring your appeal. You would ordinarily apply for leave to an Associate Justice of the Court, but there are a couple of lists. The 
planning list and the valuation list are two in VCAT where you apply directly to the judge in charge of the relevant list in the Supreme Court. So um, for the planning list and the valuation lists of VCAT, that would be the valuation, compensation and planning list in the Supreme Court. You, your leave application will be heard by the judge in charge. That's currently Justice Emerton. So you'll bypass the Associate Justice stage. In the paper, there's a table on page 15 and 16, which shows who hears the appeal. You'll see from that table that another relevant factor in determining who will hear the actual appeal is how the tribunal was constituted originally for making the decision. So it'll be one or three judges, depending on who the member of the tribunal or members were when they heard the appeal, when they heard the hearing. Back to leave, whether or not you're before an associate justice or a judge of the court, the test for leave is the same. It's in the secretary, in the case of the Secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet and Holes, so that's 1993 3VR331. That's in the paper at page 19. We've extracted the test. I won't go through all of the parts of the test. But you'll see at, I think, point E in the paper, there is a provision that is indicates that the public or general importance of the matter will be relevant to the grant of leave. So if you have a question of law that is of general importance to other cases, that is favourable to your application for leave. Now, this comes up regularly in planning appeals. The reason is that there are a lot of planning matters heard by VCAT and very few of them get up to the Supreme Court. They affect a lot of decisions that are made in the community about building and development. And the Supreme Court, anecdotally I would say, is often keen to hear matters which will be of general guidance to VCAT and to members of the community when they're making decisions about planning in Victoria. So that public or general importance aspect of the Hulls test is elevated a bit in planning matters because the courts look so favourably upon that aspect. That's not to say that every application for leave will get up, um, but there are a lot of them where you can argue that it's of general importance to planning in Victoria. And that means that the hurdle for leave is relatively low in matters such as that. Now, the practical effect is that it might be tactically better not to oppose leave if someone is bringing an appeal against a decision that was favourable to you. It might still be better to consent to the leave application, not present any opposing submissions and just go straight to the hearing. The reason is that when you file your summons for the leave application, you will need to follow that with submissions on leave and then submissions in reply. So effectively you need to ventilate your best points at the application for leave if you want to oppose it and you're giving everything away. <laughs> so if the hurdle is very low, it can be tactically better just to go straight to the hearing and have it out because if it's of general importance, you're likely to have to anyway. It saves on costs as well. It's, it's not just a tactical decision, it can save on costs for your client. So if we move back to the wording of the provisions, 
Section 148 of the VCAT Act refers to an appeal from a VCAT order. So a lot of the cases end up asking the question, did VCAT actually make an order? I'm not sure if you've seen the orders that VCAT makes. Um, they're not formal. The documents don't look formal uh, as court orders do. They're, they're quite informal. Sometimes it's very unclear what orders are actually being made and what findings are being made. It, they're a bit jumbled up occasionally. So you just get a document with a heading and then a bunch of reasons that may not specifically state order one is, order two is, which would be the case if you were getting orders from the Supreme Court or the County Court. So arguments arise as to whether you've actually got orders from VCAT. If you come up against one of these situations or you think you might have one, it's critical that you look to the legislation that referred the matter to VCAT. So an example is State of Victoria and Turner, which was a decision of the Supreme Court. It's 2007 VSC 362. That's also described in the paper. The tribunal document in that case was headed order, so it had the word order at the top. Uh, and then it went on with a series of paragraphs. It went on to find some matters proved, it dismissed some matters, and it adjourned to later hearing some of the argument. Now, Chief Justice Warren in that case found that the tribunal had only made findings of fact despite the fact that the document was headed with the word order. And Her Honour looked at the Equal Opportunity Act and conducted an analysis of the provisions that gave VCAT the power to hear the matter and looked at what their power actually was. Her Honour then compared what the power was to the reasons to see whether the power had been exercised and found that the power was not spent. Effectively, the exercise of the power hadn't occurred and so therefore a final order hadn't been made. So you would need to carefully look at the legislation in the original Act and see what it was that VCAT was supposed to do and did they discharge that power to make a final order. Don't just read the heading and say, well, this is my order. It, it's a good ground of appeal if you can argue that. Now, the procedural requirements are set out in the rules of court, remembering that the federal court on the 1st of August had a wholesale change of rules coming in. I'm sure you know about that. In the Supreme Court, uh, the relevant rules are the Supreme Court miscellaneous civil proceeding rules, in particular order four of those rules. And they provide for the filing and service of the application for leave. You need to do this by originating motion and an accompanying affidavit setting out the facts relating to the order of the tribunal and you need to exhibit a copy of the draft notice of appeal to that affidavit. The action actually comes on by filing and serving a summons, and that is to bring the leave application on, as I said earlier, either before an associate justice or before the judge in charge of the relevant list, depending on the VCAT list that your matter was heard in. At the AAT, Division 33.2 of Chapter 3 of the Rules of the Federal Court deal with appeals to the AAT. And in that court, you don't use an originating motion, you file a notice of appeal. And at the filing of the notice of appeal, a return date is fixed for a directions hearing. So there's no leave stage, remember? 
And the way that the court gets the documents in the federal court is that the AAT is required to provide all of the documents below up to the federal court. So it's a bit more like the trial division and the court of appeal where the lower court or tribunal is providing the documents to the higher court. In VCAT, that's a little bit different. You need to exhibit the relevant documents to your affidavit. So the onus is more on you to provide those documents. Um, and it's a great idea to provide transcript. Some situations you'll just absolutely need it. It'll depend on what your questions of law are. I'll leave that to Sam to discuss further. But transcript is, is important in many cases because it won't be automatically coming up from the tribunal. Now, even when you read the rules, it's not always obvious what the practical effects are, as you know, from reading something and then going to court and seeing how it actually works. Uh, one of the examples that I can give is that in the Supreme Court, you commence the action by filing an originating motion and you need to do that within 28 days of the decision. Now, if you're running out of time and you're at day 27, don't fear. Just lodge, file and serve your originating motion within the 28 days. You actually file the summons to bring the matter to court and that gives you an additional seven days. So it's 28 days to file the originating motion and then from that point it's another seven days to file the summons. So in reality, you have about 35 days as long as you get your originating motion in. The affidavit, exhibiting the documents, etc., can all come after that point. Just get your originating motion in and then you won't have to apply to extend time, which you never really want to do because there's a risk, of course, that you won't get it. Now, in the AAT, you would be filing the actual Notice of Appeal and in VCAT, you'll be filing the Draft Notice of Appeal, which will then become a Notice of Appeal if leave is granted. You'll be given leave to file that draft as a notice. So I thought it might be good to have a look at how to draft a Notice of Appeal it may have been better if I had an overhead to do this, so you'll just have to bear with me um, and I'll do it verbally. So, having worked at the Supreme Court, I can vouch for the fact that notices of appeal are often drafted very, very poorly. I was a little bit shocked. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's an art to do it, doing it, apparently, and... Um, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And since it's the foundation of your action, I was quite shocked working at the court to realise that they're often drafted very poorly and it, it's worth taking the time over it to avoid issues happening later on. So a question of law is the foundation of the appeal, so you will need to put a pure question of law in your Notice of Appeal. And articulation of that question is critical to the success of the appeal. It's the, the fundamental point at which the appeal starts. You're seeking to answer that question of law. It's the whole reason why you are in the court. You're then required to set out grounds, and this is for both the AAT and the VCAT appeals, by the way, and grounds describe the link between the question of law and the orders that you're seeking with particular reference to the circumstances of the case. So the question of law is, is an abstract, if you like, motherhood statement. The orders are the pointy end of what you actually want the court to do. And in the middle, you have the steps to get there and you bring them into your case in, in the factual scenario of your case or, or in, the, in the 
reasoning and the methodology that was employed by the tribunal in your case. You will need to look at that and link the grounds to it. I think it's best to describe it by an example. So, I will, I've prepared a notice of appeal. It's a very simple one and it's about a construction issue. So, what I'm alleging is that the tribunal misconstrued uh, some relevant legislation. So the question of law that I would have is whether the tribunal erred in finding that clause X of the Act does not impose a restriction, oh, my apologies, clause X of the planning scheme does not impose a restriction on the number of rose bushes allowed on properties in the residential one zone. I've gone with a planning example. So the question of law is a motherhood statement about whether or not the tribunal employed the correct construction of that clause of the planning scheme. Now the grounds, remember we're asking how in the circumstances of the case the tribunal erred in answering the question of law and we're stating how the question of law should be answered. So for the grounds in this instance, I would state the tribunal erred, erred in construing the words in the relevant zone in clause X as not including the residential one zone. And I would add to that, the tribunal erred in finding that the words of clause X in the planning scheme do not impose a restriction on the number of rose bushes allowed on properties in the residential one zone. So you can see that the first ground really links into the way that the tribunal arrived at its reasonings, uh, at its conclusion. I've said that the tribunal erred in construing the words in the relevant zone in clause X. So I've, I've become more specific at the ground stage and it links more to the way the tribunal went about its reasoning. I would then state what finding should have been arrived at, which is clause X of the planning scheme imposes a restriction on the number of rose bushes allowed on properties in the residential one zone. And then you'd follow on with your orders. So it's quite a simple example. Um, it's difficult to explain exactly how to draft notices of appeal, it'll be different in every circumstance and you can imagine that they become quite detailed and complex in a real situation. That was such a simple situation. Um, it's, it takes care, skill and time to draft the notice properly and if it's not done properly, for example, if your question of law isn't a pure question of law and you, you've you've mixed up some, some questions of fact, then you're liable to have your notice struck out by the other party. So it does leave you vulnerable. The better your notice of appeal is, the stronger your case, in my opinion. So if you look at the paper, there's some further details on that. Uh, it doesn't give the example. That was something I did late last night, in fact. You may be able to tell. Uh, have a read of the paper, keep it, it might come in handy and I think we'll stop for a break now and Sam will come back and have a chat later. Thanks.